Here we are with our Sunday School lesson for August the 1st. And the summer is just, gosh, it's fleeting by and, and it's certainly plenty hot in the south. We've had the opportunity to visit my parents in Ohio this past week, celebrate my mother's 92nd birthday, and uh, and it was just as hot up there. But uh, we're glad, we're glad to be out, we're glad to be out among friends, and, and it's a wonderful thing. This week we're going to start a five-week series uh, in our quarterly, and then this will finish up the, the summer, summer quarterly uh, of adult Bible studies. And we're going to start in the book of Job, and for five weeks we're going to be talking about Job. The lesson today is titled Worship, and the purpose statement is to reclaim lament as an integral part to worship. Now, Job is an interesting book. There are a number of commentaries, there's a number of people that, that have written about Job. Chuck Swindoll has written a series of books, or character studies, and I like reading those because he, he, he writes in a, in a manner that's easy to understand. And in his book, Job, A Man of Heroic Endurance, the first three words in his book are, life is difficult. <laughs> And that's a pretty accurate appraisal of, of, of our existence. I, I kind of think that, that maybe instead of that, he could have said life is unfair. And that's certainly a thought-provoking statement that goes along with that, that same theme. Job is a challenging book. Uh, you Immediately when you hear the name Job, you, things come to mind. Uh, talk about the patience of Job, or, or the you know Job endured you know great hardships, or you know, the, everybody has has a memory or has a thought when you hear the name Job. And Swindoll shares four principles that come out of the book of Job, and I think they're interesting. I wanted to mention mention them all as we get started today. He says there is an enemy we encounter, we cannot see, but the enemy is real. He says there are trials we endure that we do not deserve. He said there is a plan, and we may not understand the plan, but there is a plan. And there are consequences we experience that simply cannot be explained. That's a pretty good summary of what we're going to read about Job over the next five weeks and what we're going to be studying. Job is a book of the Bible. It's in a section of wisdom literature. It goes along with Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. And it's a book of, of poetry, but it's surrounded by prose. And, and then when we get to Job 28, that becomes a hymn of wisdom. Now, it's interesting, and there's been a lot of speculation. We're not sure who the author of Job is. A lot of theologians have argued that. They've tried to figure it out. Many of them think that it was probably Moses. We're not even sure of the date or even the context that Job was written. These, there's a lot of studies been done, people much smarter than me. And they've looked at the, the style of writing, and some have suggested that uh, toward the end of Job, that that was something that was, those details were added later, maybe even hundreds of, of years later. But, but it, there's just a lot about Job we don't understand. We don't even really know if Job was a real person or not, or if the author was just simply teaching in, in parable form like Jesus did. Unlike Proverbs, where you can take a few passage and you can, you can study and you can understand, Job must be read in its entirety. And that's what we're going to do over the next five weeks. The book is made up of advice, and we, we kind of remember some about that. Advice from friends and their response, and his response. We learn not all advice, even though it's given in, in the right uh, context, it's, it, it's given with, with heartfelt intent. It's not necessarily good advice. In many ways, as we read through Job, it's, it's an un, unsettling book. I mean, it's a book that I dare say there haven't been a whole lot of sermons preached on Job, and there really haven't probably been a lot of Sunday school lessons taught on Job. And you'll understand why as we navigate through this next five weeks. The book absolutely drives theologians crazy. James 5, 7 through 12 references Job, and Swindoll's book further references it by saying that it's a book of patience. But Job at times is anything but patience. I mean, in fact, we'll see later on that he gets so angry that he demands to see God face to face. 
Now, we talked about this last week in our lesson. We talked about the fact that there was this belief that, that we were punished because of our sin. That if you sin, you were punished. If you were sick, you were sick because you had sinned. And therefore, that sickness was a result of your punishment. We, we talked about that last week when we talked about the paralytic that was healed. And so the question becomes, if I've sinned, what have I done? What have I done to deserve this? What is my sin? I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect, but, uh, but do I deserve this? And the book will raise some questions that can be frightening at times. If not frightening, they're certainly confusing. And, and it, it's a lot of lot to, to navigate through and to discuss. It's been a book that's read and proclaimed outside of Christianity and Judaism. A lot of people have heard who Job is, have used references back to Job. Now, our lesson today will open with a portrayal of Job. He's wealthy, he's righteous, he has a large family, and he offers sacrifices for sins so that his children, if they've sinned, that, that their, their sacrifice has been made in their behalf. You're going to see the number 7 plus 3 equaling 10. And, and we're going to read about that. And, and that indicates completeness. He's got seven sons and three daughters. He's got a complete family. He's got 7,000 sheep plus 3,000 camels, 500 oxen plus 500 donkeys. So here's this, this 10 flowing through the passage, how complete his life is. The offerings were for atonement. They weren't for specific sins. And he was a patriarch. He was, he was trying to protect his family. He had this huge wealth. And he was a very powerful person. And then we're going to see that the scene changes to the court of heaven. Now there are commentaries that suggest it was the Satan. Not Satan, ruler of demons. It was the Satan. It was the evil one. The implication is that the court is held on a regular basis and that Satan is, in effect, the prosecuting attorney. He's looking for people that have sinned and pointing that out to God and that they deserve punishment. Satan says Job is simply acting righteous to be blessed. And we'll see that he bargains with God to let him test Job. Now, as we get into this, as we start reading this passage, as we go through this next five weeks, I want you to think about something. I want you to think about, and I, I try to do this. I, I've mentioned this many times. When I read the Bible, when I read a Sunday school lesson, I try to put myself in the story. I try to, try to figure out where do I fit into all of this. And so I want you to think about, I want you to focus and reflect on you and you being the type of person that could instill the level of confidence that God has in Job. What do we need to do? What type of person do we need to be that God could say to Satan, to the evil one, look at my child. Look at you. Look at me. What type of person do we have to be? And you'll notice as we, we get into this, as we read the passage, that, that the messengers deliver the news in reverse order of importance. At the beginning of the book, we're told of Job's possessions in order of importance, children, so forth. And then those possessions are taken away in reverse order. Also, they are taken away alienating or alternating between an earthly tragedy and one from heaven. So let's go ahead and, and read our lesson. We're going to start with the introduction to Job. Job 1, we're going to read 1 through 20. A man in the land of Uz was named Job. That man was honest, a person of absolute integrity. He feared God and avoided evil. He had seven sons and three daughters and owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 pairs of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a vast number of servants, so that he was greater than all the people of the East. Each of his sons hosted a feast in his own house on his birthday. They invited their sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of the feast had been completed, Job would send word and purify his children. Getting up early in the morning, he prepared entirely burnt offerings for each one of them. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned, and then cursed God in their hearts. And Job did this regularly. One day the divine beings came to present themselves before the Lord. And the adversary, 
also came among them. The Lord said to the adversary, Where did you come from? The adversary answered the Lord from wandering throughout the earth. The Lord said to the adversary, Have you thought about my servant Job? Surely there is no one like him on earth, a man who is honest, who is of absolute integrity, who reveres God and avoids evil. Can you imagine having that said about you? The adversary answered the Lord, Does Job reverse God for, revere God for nothing? Haven't you fenced him in, his house and all he has, and blessed the work of his hands so that his possession extend throughout the earth? He's, he's accusing, the adversary is accusing God of protecting Job, of, of surrounding him with, with, with a fence, with, with, his, with God's protection. And so, so then the adversary is saying, But stretch out your hand and strike all he has. He will certainly curse you to your face. The Lord said to the adversary, Look, all he has is within your power. That's fine. You do what you need to do. Only don't stretch out your hand against him. Don't harm him. So the adversary left the Lord's presence. One day Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. A messenger came to Job and said the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. When the Sabians took them and killed the young men with swords, I alone escaped to tell you. While this messenger was speaking, another arrived and said a raging fire fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and devoured the young men. I alone escaped to tell you. While this messenger was speaking, another arrived and said, Chaldean set up the three companies, raided the camels and took them, killing the young men with swords. I alone escaped to tell you. While this messenger was speaking, another arrived and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, when a strong wind came from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It fell upon the young people, and they died. I alone escaped to tell you. Job arose, tore his clothes, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I'll return there. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken. Bless the Lord's name. In all this, Job didn't sin or blame God. Now that's powerful. I mean, that, that's powerful. Just, just, just to even take a moment and think about that. I mean, look at Job's reaction. He, he, he tore his clothes. He shaved his head. He fell to the ground and he worshipped. The grief was immediate and overwhelming. I mean, think about grief for a second, and that, that's one thing that our, our lesson talks about today. This grief and how, how this tragedy disrupted all of his plans. How often that happens. It's something happens in our life. It could be the loss of someone that's close to us. It could be a friend, a family member. It could be some tragedy where we certainly, over the past year, a lot of people lost jobs. It totally disrupted our life, our plans. Our lesson mentions a term, reclaiming the ritual expression of grief. And I want to take a few minutes and talk about that. Because I think it, we need to talk about it. I think it's a, an important discussion. I've been thinking a lot about that. I've been thinking a lot about that concept, that idea over the last year, certainly. And even before that, because I think about grief, and we need to grieve. We need to express ourselves. We need time to be able to, to take in the loss. You know, probably one of the very best books I've ever written, and I encourage you to get a copy of it. It's not an expensive book. It's by C.S. Lewis. And you know C.S. Lewis as the Chronicles of Narnia, and, and I know that Jonathan, uh, pastor, and, and I know he's, he's a fan of C.S. Lewis and, and a, fan of, a fan of the Chronicles. But C.S. Lewis wrote a book, and to me it's the best book he's ever, he ever wrote, and it's titled A Grief Observed. He wrote it as somebody, as a person of faith, dealing with the death of his wife by cancer. And he was trying to he was trying to deal with that. It's, it's, it's basically a, a memoir of, uh, of his. As he was going through that experience, 
Here he was. He, he, his, his faith didn't waver. He, he, he had a deep respect and love of God. He knew that his wife was going to heaven. There wasn't a question about that. But yet he was, it was almost as if he was feeling terrible that he, he didn't want to let go. He had this grief. He had this, this deep-seated grief. And one of the things that, that, that I got out of that, and I've thought about it often, I, I think when we grieve and we try to, to work with other people, we grieve with other people, I think our Western culture, and it's mentioned here in our, our lesson today, and, and, and C.S. Lewis mentions it, our Western culture almost looks at people that are grieving and saying, you shouldn't grieve, you shouldn't take time. Well, it's okay to take a little bit of time. But, but you need to get over it. Okay, somebody died, people die, people are born, people die, they start dying when the day they're born, and eventually that's what's going to happen because that's what's going to happen to all of us. I, I, I have a couple of good friends that are in the funeral directors, and it absolutely is staggering to me the number of people who have loved ones cremated and never go back and pick up the cremains. They have to send out notices, they have to call, they have to go through a process before they can, I don't know, one friend who's in the funeral business said once a year he opens up a grave and puts all the cremains in a grave. There's a process he has to do before he does that. I, I think about during the pandemic, how many people that we lost, and we said someday we'll get around to having a memorial service or having some sort of service for them. And I dare say that most of those probably never happened or will never happen. Our society wants to just package everything up in a nice neat little bow and say, okay, that's, that's, that's done. That's behind us. Yes, it was difficult. We didn't want to lose our parents. We didn't want to lose our friends, but we did. And now we're just going to move on. And we're encouraged to do that in our society more and more and more. That was not the case back in certainly this period of time that we're reading this. It, it wasn't that way just as I remember growing up. And, and I think grief is important. One of the things I learned from C.S. Lewis's book is that there is no particular way to grieve. People can grieve in different ways. It's okay. It's all right. The other thing that I learned, and I think this is very important, is there's no timetable for grief. I've heard people say, well, it's been a couple of months, I'll be able to get over that. It's been a year, you ought to get over that. And yet I know that I also have a lot of friends that they, they think about family members. I, I, I do use social media. I do get on social media. And, and, and we, we do see people that maybe on a birthday or a special day of some kind, I'll put a picture of a parent on Facebook and say, it's been five years since we've said goodbye. And we miss them every day. We need that. We need to be able to do that. And we, as friends, as we as Christian friends, we need to grieve with them. Sometimes that grief and grieving with a, with a person, with a friend who's lost someone, it doesn't mean we even have to say anything. I think we're part of the problem is we get uncomfortable. Well, what should I say? What should I do? They, they, they lost a, a friend, a child in a very tragic way. What do I say? And so often just being there, just knowing that you're loved, knowing that you're prayed for, knowing that you're thought about deeply, that's enough. That's what we need to do. And C.S. Lewis talks a lot about that, how important that was to him, to know that his wife was not forgotten, that she would never be forgotten, that her memory was going to live on. A life well lived leaves beautiful memories. And we look, at, we look at Job. We look at his, his lament. We need to be able to grieve like we need to grieve, like we want to grieve, and it's okay. His reference to naked, I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return, is a reference to the fact that we came into this world with nothing. We were given this life by God. He breathed life into us. We had nothing, anything that we've accumulated, anything, the stuff that we've surrounded ourselves with, 
we've done that as part of God's plan. And someday we'll leave all that behind. And Job recognized that. There's beautiful lessons in Job. We're going to continue to read through Job. We're going to, we're going to hear more about those, those great messages. And it's so important. One of the things that I think about, I think about this every time I read Job, every time I study Job, and you know the reference. You know the, the potter and the clay. The clay doesn't tell the potter what to do. It's the potter who molds the clay. I think we see a lot of that in the story of Job. I think we see a lot of that in our lives. So many times I want to tell the potter how to mold the clay. But it doesn't work that way. And I think we need to think about that. I think we need to think about that as we, we spend this next five weeks. There's some beautiful messages here. Whether Job is a real person or not really doesn't make any difference. Because I also know that the Bible is the Word of God. And this is what God wants us to hear. Will you pray with me, my friends? Lord, we're grateful that you are the kind of God who will hear our cries. The kind of God who takes our authentic pain and transforms it into depth of connection. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving us friends. Thank you for giving us connection. And we ask that as we go throughout this life that we continue to see the things you want us to see, to hear the things you want us to hear, and our hearts overflowing with the love that you have put in each and every one of us. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.